Hello, and welcome to the CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. I'm Bill Sutton, Deputy Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at CDRH, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Thank you for joining us. The CDRH Industry Basics Workshop brings you the fundamentals on some key areas of FDA's medical device regulations. It's important for you to understand these basic principles in order to successfully navigate the FDA regulatory landscape. This objective addresses the core vision of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, to provide you with accurate, timely, and useful educational information about medical devices. In addition to the workshop you're viewing today, we've developed a wealth of other educational resources designed specifically for you. Please take advantage of them. One of these resources is CDRH Learn. CDRH Learn is a multimedia catalog of online educational modules, presentations, and audio webinars that cover a wide range of medical device regulatory topics. If you have a question about a specific medical device regulation or policy, this is a great place to check out. Another industry educational resource we've designed for you is Device Advice. Device Advice provides comprehensive regulatory assistance about medical devices with hundreds of web pages of information at your fingertips. The format for today's program will be as follows. We'll start with a presentation by a speaker from CDRH. At the end of the presentation, the speaker will be joined by a panel of experts also from CDRH, and we'll have approximately 20 minutes for an interactive question and answer session with you. We'll also be able to take your calls during this time. After the session has ended, we'll continue with the next topic. We'll cover two topics during today's program, which focus on the fundamentals of the Unique Device Identification Regulation, or UDI. If you are unfamiliar with UDI and want to get ready to comply with its requirements, this program has been designed with you in mind. We'll follow a schedule so you can join in for the topics that are of interest to you. We'll begin with our first topic, UDI System Regulatory Overview. At 2 p.m., we'll transition to our second topic of the day, Good ID Account Request, Preparing and Process. Good ID stands for Global Unique Device Identification Database. Thank you again for joining us today, and now let's get started. Hello, my name is Linda Sig, and I am the Associate Director of Informatics for CDRH. I lead the team that implements the Unique Device Identification, or UDI, program, and today I will provide a regulatory overview of the UDI system. The learning objectives of this session are to recognize the four steps of the UDI system, understand the labeler requirements, know the UDI compliance dates, and identify some of the UDI adoption benefits. What is the UDI system and why do we need it? Congress directed the FDA to establish a UDI system to adequately identify medical devices through distribution and use with the goal to realize many important public health benefits. The UDI system was signed into law in 2007 as part of the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act. The FDA Safety and Innovation Act was signed into law in 2012 and required FDA to impose specific compliance timeframes for certain devices. FDA published the final UDI rule on September 24, 2013. The UDI system's objective is to enable medical devices to be identified through distribution and use with specific goals, facilitate the rapid and accurate identification of a device and prevent incorrect identification, enable access to important information concerning the device, such as the company name, brand name, description, and important safety information, and provide a standard and clear way to document device use in electronic health records clinical information systems, claims data sources, and registries. The UDI program is essentially a four-step process. First, the FDA built the regulatory and technical framework for the UDI system in the final rule that was published on September 24, 2013. Next, the medical device industry needs to comply. A UDI is required on device labels and device packages 
and in some cases on the devices themselves, unless there is an exception or alternative granted by the FDA. Then, additional data about each device is required to be submitted to the global UDI database, which we call the Good ID for short. The Good ID serves as the repository of key device identification information. Finally, the success of the UDI system depends upon adoption and implementation of the UDI system by the healthcare community. Step one of the standardized system has been established. Today's discussion will focus mainly on steps two and three and the labeler's responsibilities. And for the last step, I will briefly describe several of the UDI benefits at the end of this presentation. These benefits can only be realized through successful adoption and implementation of the UDI system. As part of the UDI system, a UDI is required on device labels. What is a device label? Section 321K of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines label as a display of written, printed, or graphic matter upon the immediate container of any article. For retail devices, the UDI is required to appear on the outside container or wrapper of the retail package or be easily legible through the outside container or wrapper. This means the UDI can be on the retail package and the package can be enclosed in a clear container or wrap. What is the UDI? It is a unique string of characters on a device label, package, or in some instances on the device itself. It is both in human-readable plain text and machine-readable formats. Here are some examples of the Automatic Identification and Data Capture, or AIDC, machine-readable formats, including the 1D barcode that is on the label, the 2D barcode that is to the left of the label, and the symbol at the bottom left, which is an abstract of Radio Frequency Identification, or RFID, technology. All are acceptable machine-readable formats for UDI purposes, and for this presentation, I will use the 1D barcode for the examples. If you go back to the 1D barcode, the numbers below the barcode are the human-readable plain text form of the UDI. The UDI is composed of the device identifier, or DI, and the production identifiers, or PI. The DI is the yellow portion of the plain text on the left, and the PI is the green portion of the plain text on the right. Now let's parse the different parts of the UDI. The DI is the mandatory fixed portion of a UDI that identifies the labeler and the specific version or model of a device. Once the DI is assigned to a specific version or model of a device, the DI never changes. If a different version or model is made available, a new DI is required. The DI serves as the primary key used to look up information about the device in the Good ID. Only one labeler can be associated with each DI. The PI is the variable portion of the UDI. Except for Class I devices, when certain information is on the label, it should be in the UDI as well. This information includes lot, batch, serial number, expiration date, date of manufacture, and for human cell and tissue products, or HCTPs regulated as devices, the distinct identification code. This data will change for each lot or batch, or in the case of some devices like implantables, for each serialized device. The UDI regulations define device package as a package that contains a fixed quantity of a particular version or model of a device. Each package level requires a different UDI. Here is an example of package levels. The base package is the lowest level of a device package containing a full UDI. In this example, the base package is a single wrapped catheter. The UDI is on the individual device wrapper and the base package DI is 1001. The individually wrapped catheters are packaged in a box of 30. That box of 30 is related to the base package and is the next package level that requires a different DI, 2001. If the catheters are also packaged in boxes of 50, that would also be a next package level with a DI that is different from the DI on the box of 30, but still related to the base package DI, 
2002. Multiple boxes can also be packaged together in a case, a third package level. If boxes of 30 catheters are packaged 12 to a case, that case is a third package level requiring a new DI, but again related to the base DI 3001. Here are examples of what are not considered packages and do not require a UDI. Any type of wrapping intended to protect the device from damage during shipping. As seen in the picture on the left, this includes inner linings, bubble wrap, and other protective material. The middle picture is a pallet. Pallets are another example of a package that does not require a UDI, especially when the number of units differs from pallet to pallet. In the picture on the right, any shipping containers used to transport devices when the contents vary from one shipment to another do not require a UDI. Let's talk about direct marking. In addition to including the UDI on the label and package, the UDI needs to be directly marked on the device itself if the device is intended to be used more than once and intended to be reprocessed between uses. This permanent UDI may be in plain text, AIDC technology, or both. The direct mark UDI may be identical to the UDI on the label, or it may be different to distinguish the packaged device from the unpackaged device. What is a labeler? The labeler is responsible for compliance with the UDI requirements. The UDI rule created the term labeler, and in 21 CFR 801.3, the labeler is defined as the one who causes a label to be applied to a device or who causes the label to be replaced or modified with the intent that the device will be introduced into interstate commerce without any subsequent replacement or modification of the label. A device manufacturer is usually the labeler, but not always. The term labeler can include contract manufacturers, private label distributors, and convenience kit assemblers, as well as device repackagers or device relabelers. However, distributors who only have their name and contact information added to an existing label may not be considered labelers. At this point, we have covered the UDI and the DI and PI portions of the UDI. In addition, we have talked about the labels, packages, and who are the labelers. Now let's discuss how UDIs are created. The UDI rule requires all UDIs to be issued under a system operated by an FDA accredited issuing agency. The rule also requires the issuing agencies to create systems that conform to international standards. The FDA has accredited several issuing agencies, and labelers are required to work with at least one accredited issuing agency. For more information on how to build your UDIs, first make sure you understand the basic UDI requirements, and then follow the guidelines and use the tools provided by the issuing agency. The list of FDA accredited issuing agencies is available on the FDA website. To bring date formats in line with international standards, dates on the label intended to be brought to the attention of the user, such as expiration date and date of manufacture, must be in a specified format to harmonize with international standards. This format starts with four digits for the year, followed by two digits for the month, and then two digits for the day, separated by hyphens. For example, January 30th, 2014 will be written as 2014 hyphen 01 hyphen 30. The date format compliance date is the same as the compliance date for the UDI. Let's review the basic UDI requirements. We just covered that a UDI is required on every device label and device package, and in some cases on the device itself, unless there is an exception or alternative granted by FDA. Next, we will talk about the key information that must be submitted to the Global UDI Database, or the GoodID. The GoodID serves as the repository of key device identification information. The GoodID contains only the device identifier, or DI, 
which serves as the primary key to obtain device information in the database. Production identifiers, or PIs, are not submitted to nor stored in the Good ID. The Good ID contains only production identifier flags to indicate which PIs are in the device UDI. The Good ID does not contain any patient identifying information. There is much more information on our FDA UDI website, and there are modules that explain the Good ID data submission process in detail. Can anyone see the data that is submitted to the Good ID? The answer is a qualified yes. One of the key objectives of the UDI system is to enable healthcare professionals and others to more rapidly and precisely identify a device and obtain important information concerning the characteristics of the device. Therefore, once the labeler has verified their data, most data from the Good ID is made public via Access Good ID. Access Good ID launched in May 2015 through a partnership with the National Library of Medicine. The main features of Access Good ID are the public search capability, the database download capability, and the web services. Please check the site often as new features and functionality are being added to improve Access Good ID. To give everyone enough time to prepare and to ensure an orderly compliance with the regulation, the compliance dates for UDI requirements are phased in over a seven-year period based primarily on the device classification, with the compliance dates for higher-risk devices occurring first. Here are the key compliance dates. There are more details on compliance dates on the UDI website, which you can access using the link on this slide. All medical devices must be in compliance with the requirements of the UDI rule by the applicable compliance dates, unless an exception or alternative has been granted by the FDA. Some key general exceptions include Class I devices that are exempt from current good manufacturing practices, or CGMP, individual single-use devices of a single version or model that are sold and intended to be stored within a single device package until removed for use, devices under pre-market investigation or solely intended for non-clinical use, devices intended for export from the U.S., and individual devices in a convenience kit. In addition, a device packaged and labeled for sale prior to its compliance date is accepted from UDI requirements for three years after the compliance date. This is not an exhaustive list of the general exceptions. All of the general exceptions are listed in 21 CFR 801.30. There is also a provision that allows FDA to grant individual exceptions or alternatives. FDA may grant exceptions or alternatives either on its own initiative or in response to a request from a labeler. Labelers submit such requests to the UDI Help Desk. If you recall from the four steps of the UDI system, the last step is adoption. The UDI will clearly and unambiguously identify the device. The availability of the UDI in electronic health information allows connections to different sources of data to easily link information that was once difficult or impossible to link. With the UDI, there is now a key that unlocks the data. A specific version or model of a device could be linked to an adverse event or to a recall. And better data means better analysis of the data for faster and more accurate reporting and decisions. With the UDI as the unique key and electronically available on devices, device data for patient care can be rapidly and accurately captured and retrieved. The Good ID contains several device safety fields that help providers at the point of care. And once the UDI is available, patient safety could be improved by tracking the device through the supply chain to the point of use and beyond. For example, if the UDI is on the device and the UDI is in the EHR, then recalls can be connected to patients. FDA is working with several different partners to ensure the UDI is in electronic health records, claims, and registries. FDA also works with standards organizations to ensure there is interoperability between the data sets 
so that the data can be linked and integrated in systems. With more specific device information, it is possible to improve patient safety, identify poor performers in the marketplace, and facilitate device innovation. UDI is one of the cornerstones of the National Medical Device Evaluation System, and adoption is necessary to reap the benefits. I hope you found the information presented very informative. Remember, there are four steps to the UDI system, and steps two and three are the labeler requirements for labels and data submission. I would like to encourage labelers to be aware of your compliance dates, and please start the label and data submission processes early to ensure your requirements are met prior to the compliance date. If you would like more information about the UDI benefits, there are several listed in the preamble of the UDI rule. Thank you for your time today. If you have any questions about UDI, you can access information on our website at www.fda.gov slash UDI. Thank you for viewing the presentation on the UDI Regulatory Overview. I hope you found the information helpful, and now we're going to try to answer your questions. You can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble on the top left corner of the screen. If you'd like to ask your question live, you can also call the phone number you see on the screen now. Our next session, titled How to Prepare to Get a Good ID Account, will begin promptly at 2 p.m., so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can before then. Here to help answer your questions is Linda Sig, who just gave the presentation on the UDI Regulatory Overview. We're also joined by Loretta Chi, Regulatory Counsel, and Aaron Quincer, Regulatory Analyst, both of whom are members of the UDI team from CDRH's Office of Surveillance and Biometrics. Welcome, panel. We survived the blizzard of 2016. <laughs> and I'm glad you're all here today. So we have our first question, if you're ready. queued up. So the first question is a two-part question. You say Class I devices that are exempt from the good manufacturing practices do not need a UDI. Can I put a UDI on my label anyway, even if it's not required? Second part, if I do so, is it necessary to submit a record to the Good ID database? Yes, um, absolutely. A labeler may voluntarily add a UDI to the label of a device not required to bear a UDI by our regulations. Um, we've seen several companies actually apply UDIs across their product line for all of their medical devices in order to improve the identification of all of their devices. And to the second part of your question, um, if a labeler voluntarily adds the UDI to the label, they may also voluntarily submit a record to our Global Unique Device Identification Database. Um, and this allows the public to not only search for the device, but also to pull up device identification information. But again, it is voluntary. Great. Thank you. All true. And it's important to remember the phased compliance dates. Um, the compliance dates are all phased for a reason. Uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone had appropriate time to um, complete their implementation of UDI. So for 2016, we are uh, we have this phase the class two compliance date, and that's where we'll be focusing our efforts this year. In fact, on uh, February 1st, we will be opening the Good ID for Good ID account requests. And we encourage people to come in with their Good ID account requests starting next week. Um, so, the, so we're going to be um, focusing in the Class 2s. If you have a Class 1 device or a device that is exempt from the UDI, we do ask that you put off um, submitting your information to us until um, after the Class 2 compliance date. Can, if I can just add... Um, the phase compliance date, uh, the class three compliance date did pass in 2014. Uh, every compliance date is September 24th. So on September 24th, 2014, the class three compliance date passed. 
Just this past year, on September 24th, the implants, life-saving and life-sustaining compliance date passed. The Class II compliance date that Linda talked about is for the Class II devices that are not implantables, life-sustaining and life-supporting. And then the other compliance dates, of course, are in 2018. Uh, those are for the Class I devices. I'd also like to add that if you already have a, a good ID account because part of your device inventory includes Class III devices or implantables, life-sustaining, life-supporting, then you are free to submit to, the, to your Class II and Class I uh, DI records, but we still ask that you hold off until after the Class II compliance date has passed just because we expect a very large influx of DI records. Yeah, we do. Like Go ahead. We would just like to focus on the Class II for now. Um, and then once we have the Class II in, then focus on the Class I, which has a compliance date of 2018. So there should be sufficient time Great. for them to submit. Well, thank you for that. We already have our first caller. So we have a caller from Massachusetts on, on the line. What is your question? Yes, hi. Um, I, we distribute a Class II OPC aesthetic device, and we have separate model numbers for non-U.S. markets. My question is, do we require a UDI for those model numbers that are distributed outside the United States? No, so the UDI uh, requirements only apply to devices in commercial distribution in the United States. Great, good question. Okay. Thank you, okay. caller. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. We have our second online question now. If my company puts together a set of devices from different OEMs, that is the original equipment manufacturer companies, is a UDI needed for each device? Loretta, would you like to take that one? Sure, um, that's a good question. I believe that what the caller is asking about is, or the online requester is asking, is whether a convenience, in a convenience kit type situation, what are the requirements? And for a convenience kit, the, if, as long as the UDI is on the outside container of the convenience kit, and by the way, let me just talk about the definition of convenience kit, which is in the reg. It is two or more different devices that are packaged together for the convenience of the user. This is a very broad definition, and therefore we have just issued some draft regulations in which FDA has interpreted that definition and narrowed it somewhat so that it would be different devices that are packaged not only for the convenience of the user, but also are not reprocessed, substituted, or repackaged in any way prior to the initial use by the ultimate user. And in that situation, the devices that are inside that package are not required to have a UDI, provided that the external, the immediate container of this package does contain a UDI. Uh, does anyone have anything to yeah, add? Yeah, no, I think you covered it all. And also in the draft guidance, we talk about how the devices should be finished devices. Um, so we do have the draft guidance out there for comments. And what uh, Loretta was talking about is an exception. So if you do have a convenience kit, you may put a UDI on the label of the finished devices within the convenience kit, but it is an exception, so you do not have to as long as the convenience kit, which is a device, bears a UDI. And, and I'll also add, and we get this question a lot, if the individual devices have a UDI, mm -hmm. that is permissible. You, you don't have to take your labels yeah, yeah. off the devices to have the, uh, the, the package be considered a, a, a convenience kit. I believe the uh, draft guidance has been out for about a month, so there's about another 60 days for comments. And we are encouraging comments. We yes. are soliciting comments. Good. Thank you. Our next question. We are looking for clarification on UDI requirements for reusable surgical instruments. Is on-device engraving or marking of the UDI required? It's a two-part question. Also, please clarify the expectations and timeline if UDI marking is required for reusable instruments. Uh, Loretta, maybe you could take this one. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. First part is we are looking for clarification on UDI requirements for reusable surgical instruments. 
is on-device engraving or laser marking on the UDI, UDI required. Okay, let me talk about direct marking generally. First of all, we do not specify the type. Think of direct marking as a permanent UDI. Don't think of it as etching because we do not specify or require that the permanent UDI actually be etched on. Any permanent marking that, uh, that it will last the expected lifespan of the device, life expectancy of the device, taking into account the intended use of the device and also the recommended cleaning process or reprocessing uh, requirements of the device, as long as the, the, the UDI is, will, is expected to outlast that, then uh, we, we accept that form of direct marking. With respect to the timeline, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but generally speaking, and this is just general, there, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, there are two, two sets of requirements in UDI. There is the label, or I should say two sets of compliance dates. There is the label and uh, data uh, submission requirement. That's one compliance date. And then there's a direct mark requirement. Uh, compliance date, and those are for the devices that are required to be direct marked. And generally, they're about two years apart. So first, you would have the label and data submission requirement, and then about two years later, you would have the direct mark requirement as uh, compliance date. Yeah. So they may they may etch the UDI onto the device if it does not affect the safety or, or effectiveness of the device. Um, but like Loretta said, we're not going to tell the labelers how they need to directly mark the device. It is up to them to determine a method to properly mark it. Well, I might also add, and, and the regulations do specify this, that in direct marking, there are two forms of the, ID, of the UDI that's required in, on the label, both the plain text and the machine-readable format. But for direct mark, you, have, have, you can have either one or both. You're, you're not required to have both forms. In the, in the permanent UDI. Good. Thank you. Our next question. If our product is a Class II standalone software product, what do I need to do for UDI? Erin, sure. take, take this one. Um, so standalone software is considered a medical device, so it does need to comply with the UDI requirements. Um, there are some special requirements for standalone software. Uh, all standalone software must display the easily readable plain text UDI on either the uh, about command, if you do a menu command, or when the software starts. Um, so again, this is the plain text. They do not need the AADC form when the software is started. And for standalone software that is not distributed in package form, um, for instance, if it is downloaded off the web, that standalone software must convey the version number as a production identifier in the UDI. Um, and then for standalone software that is distributed in packaged form, the label and the device packages must bear the UDI, similar to other medical devices in both the easily readable plain text and the AIDC technology form. Um, and we've actually seen some labelers come in and they have the same version of standalone software but distributed in both package form and not package form. And they can use the same device identifier, the same DI, for both forms of the standalone software. But they can also have different DIs. Yep. If for, if for inventory distribution purposes, they want to be able to distinguish between the download software and the package software. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Good question. Thank you. Next question. What should the format of the barcode be? Can there be two QR barcodes on the same box? Anybody want to take I, that one? I can take that one. Um, so as Linda mentioned in her presentation, the UDI must be in the easily readable plain text and the AIDC technology form. Um, we've had a lot of questions from labelers asking what specific type of AIDC we require. Um, and we don't require a specific type. We actually encourage the labelers to go out and talk with their customers see what type of barcodes they want, see what type of barcodes they can use, and also talk to their FDA-accredited issuing agency to discuss the different options that are out there. Um, and in the case where a label may be too small to fit a 1D um, concatenated, 
they can actually split up the barcode into uh, multiple segments. So they can have two segments of the barcode if that helps with, uh, with the spacing of the label. And if I may also add, it doesn't only have to be a barcode form. It can be any AIDC okay. format. Uh, deliberately, we have kept things broad and, and, and flexible because we realize that technology will continue on and uh, the technology, AIDC technology, may have new forms that we're, we're not even anticipating yet. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. So we have our next caller from sunny San Diego. San Diego, what is your question for the panel? Hi, uh, my question is, um, we have a medical device that is packaged, but the device is too small to place a UDI onto, and I was wondering uh, what the requirements were for that. So, yeah, so are you talking about for direct marking? Is the, requir is the device required to be directly marked? No, the, the device is actually packaged, but the package is, uh, because the device is very small, the package is also very small. And the, it, they are individually packed, but I'm not sure how, how I could or how I would place an individual UDI on each of the medical devices. Yeah, so we have seen several instances where the labels are small. Um, and we do encourage you to work with, you know, your FDA credit issuing agencies to see what kind of what kind of AADC technology you can use, and if you can split up the UDI into multiple segments, so it's not the one long string. Um, so we do encourage you to to seek some assistance from your FDA credit issuing agencies and try to fit it on. Um, you can also come to us through the help desk, where we do have some um, helpful advice we can give you based on. The specific situation, again, it's, it's kind of hard without seeing the label to really know what perhaps you could be doing to try to fit it on. Um, and we also do have an exception for when it's not technologically feasible. Um, all, all but in most cases, there are some, there are some um, tweaking you can do of the label to get it to fit on because it is required. And, and exceptions is kind of a, an extreme situation. Mm -hmm. We're also encouraging alternatives. Mm -hmm. The requirement of the UDI is that it be on the device label mm -hmm. and it is possible that you might be able to place the UDI on something other than the device label mm -hmm. in, perhaps in another package that contains the original packaging or in an outer wrapper or something like that. But in, in that type of situation you would have to come to us and ask for an alternative and have that alternative granted. Mm -hmm. But we encourage you to submit any alternative suggestions you have before giving up and saying, well, the label's too small, we can't do it. And if you do um, submit to the help desk, please make sure that you include um, as much information as possible. Be very specific when you submit to the help desk. It eliminates a lot of the back and forth. And um, if you have, you know, samples of your label, you can submit the samples as well. In fact, we encourage it. In that type of situation, really, illustrations, pictures would be very helpful. Good, good. Does that answer your question, caller? I think so. I think so. Great. So we're going to move on to our next question, speaking about e exemptions. Loretta, you were just mentioning. This question is, is it possible to request an exemption for a medical device product line? And if so, what is the process for doing so? What information would the FDA need or expect to review? Um, let me just first say that we don't really have, the word exemption doesn't really exist in the UDI rule. We have two, two procedures. One of them is alternative, which is something different than what the UDI rule requires, and the other one would be an exception from the UDI rule altogether. Um, and as I said, we, we really would, we really discourage and all, uh, uh, an individual exception, except for the general exceptions that are provided for in the rule itself. But Aaron's really the one, in, uh, the person on our regulatory team who handles uh, exceptions and alternatives, so I'm going to turn the question to, to Aaron. Yeah, so I'm assuming they, they mean the exceptions. Like Loretta said, we don't have, we're not granting exemptions. Um, and exceptions are only if the UDI requirements are not technologically feasible. 
Um, so we actually have not seen many cases where it is not technologically feasible to add a UDI to the label. Um, and the alternative, which, you know, if there are some instances you may need an alternative, if the alternative would allow for a more accurate, precise, or rapid identification of that device, or if it improves the safety or effectiveness of the device. So those are the um, criteria we use, and we do have a process by which you can request if it meets that criteria. So we would suggest that you go to the UDI webpage and um, submit a request and find some more information from our help desk. So no exemptions. No exemptions. There may be exceptions, but case-by-case case basis. Mainly right. alternatives. Right. Right. Alternatives, great. Right. Yeah. Good question. Right. Next question. Does the UDI need to be on the product itself, not just the primary packaging? For example, I have a handheld device, Class 2 OTC. Does the UDI need to be on the handheld portion or just the packaging of the handheld? That depends on whether the device is intended to be used. There is, there is the direct marking requirements that we talked about earlier. And if the device is intended to be used on more than one patient and intended to be reprocessed between uses, then that device itself is required to have a permanent UDI, a direct mark UDI. Otherwise, the, re the regulations require that the UDI be on the device label and device package. Great. Good question. We have our third caller and our first international caller from Munich, Germany. Uh, you're on the, your question for the panel, Nina, Germany. Um, yes, hello. We have a very big instrument that is shipped in two boxes. And do the two boxes uh, need to have two UDIs if the one instrument is built together on site for the customer? So, you know, the purpose of the UDI requirements are to allow for the adequate identification of the device from distribution through use. So if these two boxes are not going to remain together, you know, you need to be able to adequately identify the device through distribution. Um, so we would suggest that you have the UDI available at the point of distribution and the point of use. But it's two different uh, UDIs on the two boxes? It depends how they're, it dep really depends on how they are going to be working through the supply chain. If they're really going to travel together, which is yeah. probably not likely just because I can't think, of, even if you were to use a commercial distrib uh, carrier, I, I think the two boxes would get separated somehow, in which case you would have difficulty differentiate, being able to determine which part of the device is in which box, unless you have two different UDIs. Mm -hmm. You may have the same DI. Is the device oh. finished? Well, it has to in be. In the boxes, it has to be assembled. It has to be assembled once it reaches the destination. Okay. So you might have the same DI, mm -hmm. but you would probably have two different boxes. PIs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Our next question. Where must the UDI code be located on the device? If a device is wrapped in a clear plastic, can the UDI code be on the clear plastic instead of the device label? If a single medical device is placed in a box that is not see-through, can the UDI code be placed on the box and not on the device label? I know that was a lot. Do you want me to repeat that? The first part of the question was about UDI code must be located on the device. If the device is wrapped in clear plastic, can the UDI code be on the clear plastic instead of the device itself? You mean on the device, this, on the device itself or the device label? They're talking about the packaging, the clear. Okay, so, so if I understand it correctly, the device is in a package, there is a label on the package, and then there's a clear wrap around the package in which case the UDI would be, would be required to be on the label itself, not on the clear wrapping. Mm -hmm. If it's on the clear wrapping, then you would have to, you'd have to submit for an, a request for an alternative mm -hmm. and be granted that alternative. So that's the answer to the first half of Yeah, the that sounds like 
that, that was the question. And the part two is, if a single medical device is placed in a box that is not see-through, can the UDI code be placed on the box and not on the device label? And that goes to adequate distribution. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, the UDI is required on the device packages, um, but it is also required on the device label. So it would need to be on the label in addition to the device packages. It depends what you mean by package. I mean, if you have a device that's in a package and the package is really the device. And the label is on the package. And the label's on the package rather than on the device itself, then it would, it would be on the package because the label's on the package. Does that It sounds sense? like this yeah. needs to come through the help desk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's an example where we don't have enough facts to really... Right. Right. So... As Linda said earlier, be very specific when you submit your questions to the UDI help desk. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, we manufacture one device which is sold in different colors. Do you expect us to have UDI for each color that is sold? Anyone wish to take this? I will say that this goes to the question of what is a version or model of a device, and we basically give the labeler a great deal of flexibility about determining what is a version or model of the device. Having said that, the, you also are required to comply with or follow the systems of your FDA accredited issuing agency in how that particular issuing agency requires the UDIs to be developed because it is actually the labeler who develops the UDI, but in conformance with the systems developed by the um, accredited issuing agencies. And so you have to really check with your issuing agency to determine to, to, ask, to ask them what their requirements are as well. Thank you, Loretta. We have our next caller, Al from California. What is your question for the panel? Al, Al from California, uh, what is your question for the panel? My question is that if you have a capital equipment uh, class 2 device that typically remains at a customer site for a number of years, but the software, which is a major component of it, is updated on an annual basis, can the UDI for the capital equipment be put as part of the software? Well, okay, let me, let me take a stab at this by saying, um, first of all, Aaron talked about standalone software, and if you're talking about system software, then the rules governing standalone software don't apply. So then the question is whether this is a component of a device, mm -hmm. and we didn't really talk about components and accessories, but I guess perhaps now might be as good a time as any to discuss it. Um, so let me talk about components and accessories because that's something that we, a question that we get a lot. Uh, I will tell you that that is very fact specific. It is very hard to generalize without having the specific facts in front of you about what, you know, how do we define component, how do we define accessory, and there's a lot of blurred edges around both definitions. But as a general rule, an accessory is something is a, is a product, a device that has been separately cleared or approved by the FDA, generally is also sold separately from the parent device. A component, by, by contrast, is a part, if you will, that is not a device, and it is, it is not cleared and approved by the FDA. It is an integral part of the entire device system and really cannot operate on its own. So that generally, for the most part, is how we differentiate between components and accessories. An accessory requires a UDI, and a component generally doesn't. Having said that, is the software a component? It, and whether will it require a UDI? First of all, let me just say that we do require the UDI to be on the device label, and so therefore we will accept it to be on the software, but it still needs to be on the label as well. So you cannot substitute 
placing the UDI on the software as a substitute for having put it, having put it on the label. Now, the question of whether you need to change the UDI, whether it's a new DI, depends on whether the upgrade to the software creates, in, creates a new version or model of the device. And without the facts in front of us, it's very hard for us to determine. It's either, it's a very comp, this is a complicated area. And I so, think you explained it well. Okay. Yeah. So I hope that uh, was helpful, Al. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next question. And I think uh, Linda talked about this in her presentation earlier. What is the timeline for implementation of unclassified implantable devices? Unclassified implantable devices. Unclassified. Unclassified. So that would be all implantable devices had the compliance date of September 24th, 2015. Um, so doesn't that matter, regardless of class. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So. I think they're referring to the, the pre-amendment devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe just to expand on the question, um, so the Class 2 compliance date is this year, Class 1 is in 2018. Um, there are devices that do not require a UDI, and that is the um, CGMP exempt devices. Mm -hmm. um, class 1 devices also, just uh, for your information, um, you can use, uh, they only require a DI and you can use a UPC for the Class 1 devices. I believe unclassifieds are, are 2018 as well, right? But this is the implant? But yeah, no, yes, yeah. right. A, Implants yeah. are, right. yes. Implantable mm -hmm. device. But right. unclassifieds right. generally that mm -hmm. are not implants yeah, have a compliance of 2018. 2018. Right. Correct. So our next question is keeping in line with the timeline. This is, if we have a currently marketed Class 2 device without a UDI, we have three years to add the UDI to these uh, product labels. That's the question. Do we have three years to add the UDI to this product label for a Class II device? Do you want to answer? Sure. So um, you do not have to bring back your products that are already in commercial distribution to add UDIs. Um, the UDI requirement applies to devices put into commercial distribution after the compliance date. Um, so for Class II, that is September 24, 2016, um, and he mentioned, or the, the labeler asked about three years. Um, so we do have a three-year exception for devices that are finished, manufactured, and labeled prior to its compliance date. So if a product is finished, manufactured, and labeled, and it's class two, and it's done so before the September 24, 2016 deadline, they do have three years before they would need to put the UDI on those devices before entering commercial distribution. If the device has already been purchased by somebody, it's already it's, a that, that's yeah that yeah. you don't have to bring it back and yeah. put a UDI on it because it's been sold. Yeah. Right. Good question. We have about five more minutes for questions, so let's see how many more we can get through. Uh, this next question is: If we have a 510k exempt product, do we fall into the UDI exemption? No. no. UDIs are required for 510K exempt. They are not required for CGMP exempt. All right, good. Mm -hmm. Good question for clarification. And there's, we don't, we have exceptions, not exemptions. <laughs> right, no exemptions, only exceptions. All right, our next question. Our device consists of multi-use unit within an outer packaging box. Do we need to have a separate UDI on the multi-use unit as well as the outer packaging? Is that you mean, you mean multi-use meaning used on more than one patient and reprocessed between uses? Is that? I think in which that, case, yes, yeah. you would have to have it on the device and on the label. If that's the question. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I would interpret it as that. Okay. Thank you, Loretta. Let's take, uh, I think we have about time for one more question. What role does the FDA accredited issuing agency play? What specifically are they doing? Anyone um, wish to take that? I can take that one. The FDA accredited issuing agency is the body that the labeler works directly with to, um, to work with them to build their UDIs, to develop their UDIs. The, uh, Accredited issuing agency will give you a um, 
company identifier and then the labeler uses that identifier to build out their UDIs based on their inventory and following their um, accredited issuing agency guidelines. Um, it's also very important for the labeler to be aware of the UDI rule requirements in addition to their issuing agency guidelines. Any, any other comments to that? Yeah. Well, there's three, there's three accredited, FDA accredited issuing agencies, uh, and uh, you're, you are required under the regulations to, to go to one of them to uh, get, your, get your labeler ID and to uh, get the guidelines to build out your UDI. Um, of the three, ICC BBA is um, mainly used for human cell and tissue products. Um, and if you don't have a human cell and tissue product, you can use either of the other two issuing agencies, which are GS1 and HIVIC. Good. And you can find the issuing agency information on our UDI website. Right. Okay, I think we're going to squeeze in one more question. Hopefully it's not a difficult one. How do global trade identification numbers correlate to UDIs? Are they the same? So... GTINs, they are from one of our three issuing agencies, GS1. Um, they're typically 12 digits long, and so it's a bit shorter than when GS1 would give you their full DI. Um, so a GTIN does not equal a UDI, um, but it can be used to develop a UDI if you decide to use that particular FDA-accredited issuing agency. Great. So I think that's... Our last question for this panel, thank you so much panel members, thank you. and thank you for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes our segment on the UDI Regulatory Overview. We hope you found this program informative. We have a survey that you'll find on our website. We'd like to hear from you as this helps us to plan future programs that meet your regulatory needs. That link is being shown on the screen now. Let's now transition to our second topic of the day, how to prepare to get a good ID account. At the conclusion of this presentation, we'll bring back another expert panel for an interactive question and answer session with you. See you in a little while. Hello, my name is Chris Diamond and I am a UDI program analyst in the Office of Surveillance and Biometrics in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. The unique device identification system, final rule, requires labelers of medical devices placed into U.S. commercial distribution to submit certain device identification data for their devices to the FDA. This data is submitted to the Global Unique Device Identification Database which we call the Good ID. But before labelers can submit device records to the Good ID, their organization must first request a Good ID account using the link provided on this slide. In this presentation, I will help you understand the Good ID account request process, prepare the necessary information to open your account and make successful data submissions, Evaluate your Good ID data submission options, choosing the right one for your organization's needs, and understand how to use the FDA UDI Help Desk to request an account and also to ask the UDI team any questions you may have about UDI requirements. Before we discuss the account request process, it is important to understand the roles within the Good ID since this information will be needed to set up your account. This slide shows the roles of business entities. First is the organization. This is the highest corporate level of a company. The Good ID account is registered to the organization. It is the organization that is ultimately responsible for meeting the data submission requirements for a particular device. Next is the labeler, which is the company or firm whose name appears on the device label. It is responsible for submitting the data to the Good ID, and its name and address is associated with the device record in the database. Organizations may choose to use third-party submitters, 
to submit records on a labeler's behalf. This process will be discussed later in the presentation. Note that an entity may serve more than one role for an account. You may change information about labelers and third parties after you establish your account. Individuals also have roles. The regulatory contact is the person responsible for ensuring the organization is complying with their Good ID submission requirements. This role may be filled by a third party representative if the organization chooses. The account coordinator manages the Good ID labeler accounts. They also create and manage the labeler data entry user accounts. LDE users submit the required information for each device to the Good ID. Note that an individual may serve more than one role for an account. You may change the people designated for a given role after you establish your account. The Good ID account request consists of a three-page Adobe PDF document. It needs to be requested through the link provided on slide two, which is part of the UDI website. It is configured to be editable and we urge all account applicants to complete their application electronically. This will prevent transcription errors by the applicant or the FDA data analyst handling the request. The account request is divided into seven sections. They are the labeler organization, regulatory contact, good ID submission option, pre-market application number, labeler DUNS, coordinator, and third-party submitter if applicable. Now I'm going to talk about the information needed in each section, starting with the organization. As I mentioned, the labeler's organization represents the highest corporate level of the business. An organization may have more than one labeler associated with their account. All organizations must have a Dun & Bradstreet numbering system or DUNS number. Please see the provided link for more information. The DUNS number for the organization may represent the location of headquarters or may be the parent DUNS for labelers that are part of the organization requesting the account. When you go to submit device records, the Good ID will automatically pull the labeler's name and address for a given record from the DUNS database, so keeping your organization's DUNS information up to date is crucial to providing accurate device identification through the Good ID. Next is the regulatory contact. Again, this is the individual responsible for ensuring that your organization is meeting their Good ID submission requirements. They will be the point of contact for communications from the FDA to your organization. The regulatory contact may be a member of your organization or a third party that you choose to represent you. If you choose to delegate contact duties to a third party, you will need to provide a letter from an authorized member of your organization on company letterhead as part of your account request, stating for which devices the third party will serve as contact, how long the third party will serve as contact, and who will notify the FDA in case the third party is modified or removed. Next, choose your data submission option. The Good ID offers two methods for submission, via web interface or the Health Level 7 Structured Product Labeling Standard. The web interface option goes directly to the production environment. Device records may be created and published at any time after getting your account. When records are published, they are available for viewing and searching in the public-facing portion of the Good ID. To use the HL7 SPL submission option, you'll first need to establish an account in the pre-production testing environment. This testing allows you to ensure that your system is properly configured to make submissions to the Good ID. Pre-production records are not publicly visible and do not satisfy the requirements of the UDI rule. Once this testing is complete, you must then request a production account for your organization. Please note that the HL7 SPL production account also includes web access and allows for data entries to be made through either method. The web interface environment is a form-based method 
for entering the required device identification information. You can only enter one record per entry. This method should be familiar to users who have experience using web-based services and may be easier for users with less technical expertise. Since web interface accounts don't require pre-production testing, they should be the best option for labelers who expect to submit a small number of records. The HL7 SPL environment is an extensible markup language, or XML, based submission method. It relies on XML schema to format information for submission through the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway, or the ESG. The HL7 SPL process allows entries of multiple records simultaneously. All users of this method must establish an account through the ESG service. The ESG account is separate from your GoodID account and is not administered by the UDI team, but is required to submit HL7 SPL records. Because the HL7 SPL submission requires more technical expertise and adds steps to the submission process, we recommend this method for users who are submitting a large number of records. Also, note that labelers may use a third party to submit device records on their behalf. In the next section of the account request, provide a valid FDA pre-market number for a currently marketed device. We are allowing labelers to get GoodID accounts based on UDI compliance dates, which are phased in by class of device. We need the pre-market number to validate that a labeler is eligible to open an account. This section of the account request lists the classes of devices currently able to submit to the GoodID and is updated as new classes become eligible. Labelers may provide any of the following pre-market numbers. Pre-market approval, or PMA, pre-market notification, or 510K, de novo classification, or humanitarian device exemption. FDA listing numbers are not valid entries. Additionally, since the pre-market number is only used to validate submission eligibility, only one valid number must be provided on the account request. As we've discussed, every organizational account must designate at least one labeler entity. The labeler DUNS number is the DUNS number of the labeler who is responsible for submitting to the GoodID for a particular device. This may be the same DUNS number as the organization applying for a GoodID account, or a different DUNS if the labeler is not the same as the organization. Again, when it comes to submitting actual device records, you will need to provide the labeler DUNS to identify the labeler associated with a particular device record. And the company name for that DUNS number should match what is on the device label. The next section requires you to list coordinator information for your organization. These individuals are responsible for managing the Good ID account for a specified labeler DUNS. Each coordinator may be responsible for one or more labeler DUNS numbers and the device records associated with them. The coordinators are responsible for creating the labeler data entry or LDE accounts. These are the individuals who can create and edit device records for each labeler DUNS. A coordinator may also serve as an LDE user. Coordinators may work for the labeler organization or may be third-party representatives. They may be added and removed at the discretion of the organization. Note that while coordinators can make changes to LDE users on their own, if your organization wants to change coordinators, you'll need to request that through the help desk. The final section of the account request allows the labeler to authorize a third-party submitter. Third-party submitters are entities authorized to submit to the good ID on behalf of a labeler. The third party must follow the same testing procedures, even if the third party has done testing and submitted data for other labelers in the past. Third parties may independently request pre-production accounts to test their IT services prior to submitting for a client or being designated as a third party on a labeler's account request. This allows third parties to do testing without a labeler, but we don't give third parties access to the production environment on their own behalf. The labeler organizations must still submit the required test results 
even if they are using a third-party submitter who has already tested in the pre-production environment. The labeler organization retains all data access capabilities and rights to the data submitted and may change or stop using a third party at any time. Again, organizations are ultimately responsible for meeting the data submission requirements of the UDI rule. Based on our experience with account requests, taking the following steps will help ensure a successful application and prompt access to the good ID. The first step is to ensure that all sections are completed. The third party section is only needed if you choose to use a third party instead of submitting data from the organization itself. Each section provides a narrative explanation of the information required, but if it remains unclear, please contact the UDI Help Desk. The second step is to confirm the accuracy of your information in the DUNS database for all labeler and organization DUNS numbers associated with your account. The third step is to identify individuals for each good ID user role. The fourth step is to verify that your device belongs to one of the classes open to good ID entry. Only labelers of device classes currently open for data submission may request an account. Last, to ensure help desk communications arrive correctly, please have your organization's requester, regulatory contact, and coordinators configure their email filters to accept responses from the email domain shown on this slide. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the FDA UDI Help Desk, which is the primary method for account requesters, or anyone, to interact with the UDI team. We get thousands of questions every year about UDI, and funneling questions through the Help Desk allows us to keep track of all the questions and make sure that you get the right answer to your question as promptly as possible. The web location for the Help Desk is displayed on this slide. For any requests or questions you have regarding the process or any UDI-related issues, all you need to do is fill in the provided fields on the website and submit your inquiry. Once your inquiry is received, you'll receive an automatically generated email response acknowledging receipt of your inquiry. This response will have a case number used to track responses and follow-ups to your question. The Help Desk will serve as your point of contact with the UDI team. To get the best service, here are some best practices. First, when submitting a Help Desk inquiry, please provide complete contact information. This allows us to track your submission history and ensures that we can easily find prior submissions. Second, submit a Help Desk inquiry for a single question whenever possible. This allows us to assign the inquiry to the person on the UDI team who can give you the right answer in the shortest time. Third, keep follow-up questions for a particular inquiry in the same email thread. This can be done by simply replying via email to the most recent email on that question that you received from the help desk. Fourth, if you have a different question from the one you sent in before, submit a new inquiry. That's because we may need to assign your new question to a different UDI team member than the one who handled your previous question. Opening a new inquiry ensures that your new question gets directed to the person who can give you the right response as quickly as possible. Finally, if you need to send attachments with your inquiry, look for the system-generated auto-response email that you'll receive after you submit to the help desk. Then respond to the auto-response email with your attachment and the attachment will be added to the inquiry's case file. This is also the way you can submit your HL7 SPL test results if your organization chooses that submission method. In summary, remember that data submission to the good ID is necessary to comply with the UDI rule requirements. Before you can submit good ID data, you need to establish a good ID account following the procedures we've just discussed. The good ID offers two submission options and you should choose the one that best suits your organization's needs. If you have any issues setting up your account, use the help desk to communicate with the UDI team. We call upon you to use all links and resources for the UDI program, including links to the account request and already published guidance information, which may be found at our website listed on this slide. We look forward to working with you. Thank you for watching.
Thank you for viewing the presentation on how to prepare to get a good ID account. I hope you found it informative. Again, I'm Bill Sutton, Deputy Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We're joined now by your presenter, Chris Diamond, as well as our panel of experts, Linda Sig, Associate Director for Informatics, who presented on the UDI Regulatory Overview in our first hour, as well as Indira Kondori, Good ID Program Manager, a member of the UDI team from CDRH's Office of Surveillance and Biometrics. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble on the top left corner of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now to ask your questions live. We're available to take your questions until 3 p.m. This is your time to interact with our medical device experts, so we'd love to hear from you. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions you've already submitted. And again, welcome panel and our new members, Chris and Ndori. Uh, the first question we have, when will Good ID account creation be available to Class 2 devices? Linda, would you like to take that? Yes, we will be opening the Good ID for account requests on February 1st on Monday. And that is for any Class 2 labeler who does not already have an account. Uh, we encourage everyone to please get your account requests in very quickly, get them in early, um, at least by April, no later than June, because we will be um, having staff focused on getting through the account request process with you um, for that period of time. Thank you. One thing I would like to add is once you uh, submit a request for an account, you can anticipate that it should take one to two business days for the account to be established. Now this will happen if you can complete two tasks. The first is to get them in early, as Linda said. Once we uh, transition into the summer months, we start to get a little bit higher volume. Uh, we start to back up a little bit, and that can delay your processing. Uh, second, you want to make sure that you have complete information when you submit your form. This is necessary for two reasons, the first of which is if we have to establish correspondence with a requester, the back and forth is obviously going to slow down the process. Uh, but secondly, if any sort of information needs to be changed by already existing account users, the same people who are processing the Good ID account requests will be processing those changes as well. And it can create a little bit of a jam up. So if everybody tries to make sure that they have accurate and uh, prompt submissions, it will be better for all parties involved. Good. We are preparing for very brisk business this year. I'm sure, <laughs> with the Class 2s. Good question. Moving on to our next question. How do I know... Oh, I'm sorry, I was on the wrong... No, no, I got the right question. Just a moment. How do I know which Good ID submission option works best for me? Um, I can take that, Bill. So... Um... There are two options, as Chris mentioned in the presentation. There is the Good ID web interface option, which is a manual data entry option. And then there is the Good ID HL7 SPL submission option, where you send in your information as XML files. The Good ID web interface option is suitable for those who have a small volume of submissions because it is manual data entry process. The HL7 SPL is definitely suitable for those who have a large volume of submissions. And it is more resource intensive. You need to uh, pull your data, um, device identification data, into the XML format that we have specified. And the format and all the information necessary is on our website. Once you do that and you have your XML ready, there is a testing process that we've put in place just because you are sending us files and we want to make sure the file gets loaded into Good ID correctly. And once you complete testing, then you will be provided a production Good ID account. So then you can submit your production data um, into Good ID. So the SPL option, again, is resource intensive. It is suitable for those with large volume of submissions. And it does take time. Um, so it is good to allow plenty of time if a labeler chooses to take the HL7 SPL submission option. The web interface option, again, is easier for those with a small volume of submissions, and it is a manual data entry process. Thank you. Our next question. If you load a DI record manually, 
can you use an automated solution to update the DI data in the future to the good ID load process? So by DI manually, I'm assuming the person is using the web interface and doing a single DI entry at a time. That's, that, that's what it sounds that's like. That's what it sounds like, um, correct. You wouldn't be able to do that with your web account. Uh, there's no procedure for setting up an automated web solution. If you want to do automated entries of any sort, it really is preferable for you to go through the HL7 SPL process. Even though there is the extra work on the front end, if you would like to automate it in the future, and of course this will be a, an ongoing uh, process with your company, it might be worth your while to consider that option. Right, and, and to add on to that, so if somebody were to submit a record via the data entry option initially, and then, uh, and we've had cases where we've had, um, you know, labelers who were wanted to do SPL and then due to compliance date and lack of time in which they couldn't complete the process that, that I just described with the testing process, they have decided to do the manual data entry. But then they've come back later and they completed the SPL process and now they want to use the SPL XML submission option. They definitely can do that. Um, to update their records that were initially submitted manually later on with the XML submission option absolutely can be done. Um, what we would recommend, though, is that they do some testing with the pre-production Good ID system to make sure that the updates are occurring correctly and their solution is able to do those updates as it should occur. And once they complete testing, then they can go on to production. And we have information on our website on, about this process, and definitely the help desk is available, and we're glad to provide assistance. So you're not locked into the one. If you start the manual system, you can transition to the other. Absolutely. And both options are available to anyone who would like to use it. There are some edit rules, of course, they need to keep in mind. If, if a record is submitted via the web option, they can only update that record via the web option during the DI record grace period. And um, I know I'm throwing in a new term here. The grace period really is the time that we provide users to um, review their data, make sure the um, data is correct, and make any edits before the data goes out to access good ID, which is the public um, um, uh, public access um, option we have. It's our portal where public users can come and view it. So we want the record to not constantly change once it goes out for public use. So after the grace period, certain data elements are locked from editing. So if somebody were to submit a record via the web, during that grace period, they can only update that record via the web. After the grace period, they can use either or uh, option. Uh -huh. So both are available, and um, information is on our website, and, and we're available via the help desk as well. Good, good, good question. Thank you for that clarification. Our next question, does the labeler Dunn's number, name, and address need to match the name and address on the label of the device? Yes, it does. It's, it's very important for the DI records to have accurate uh, labeler information on them. And in order to correctly associate a DI record with the labeler who's submitting it, we need that information to be accurate. The DUNS number, or the DUNS uh, service will allow you not only to obtain a DUNS number, but to edit any information that you need to in the future. So if this is something that you didn't do because you didn't realize you had to, this is a good warning and a good opportunity to go ahead and change those things within the DUNS system. If the information changes later on, then you will need to go into DUNS, uh, change the information, and then contact us so we can make sure that the good ID side is updated accordingly. But yes, they absolutely need to match. Okay, right. so. just, just to add on to, to Chris's comment, I think the name is an absolute must. The name must match. Um, you know, ideally, like Chris said, we would definitely want the address to match as well. But name is paramount, uh, mainly because if a consumer were to pick up the label, look at what label, what name is on the label, and they go into Access Good ID and they try to pull up a Good ID record, we want to make sure that they are associating the correct record with what they have in their hand with the label. So name is paramount. Address is we would you know extremely desirable that they both match, but name is definitely a must. So important that they go into the Duns and make sure that that's accurate yes. and current and it's going to match before they go into the good ID. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's good information. Okay, let's move on to the next question. 
Uh, can one company have one account with two labeler IDs? So it says here one company but two duns assigned to the account. Does that make sense? So one good ID account with two labeler duns. Yes, they, they, they may. And um, I guess what we would deem from that would be that they probably have devices with the different company names. So duns one, two, three, four may say company A and duns five, six, seven, eight may say company A1. And company A is on the label, company A1 is on the label, and we want to have make sure that they match. Now, if company A is the only thing on the label, then they don't need to have two dunce number. One is sufficient. So the idea of collecting dunce is that we don't want to collect dunce for the sake of collecting dunce. It just provides us a way to uh, make sure we are capturing name and address information in a standardized fashion. So labelers have control of what shows up in good ID. They update in DNB database. All we're doing is we're putting the dunce number in and we're pulling the name and the address. Oh, that's good to know. Right. So we have our first caller Great. on the line from Chicago. Uh, caller, what is your question for the panel? Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is, is there any uh, recommended or authorized uh, third party who's uh, eligible to do the UDI uh, for, for companies? There's some static on the line, but I think the question was, are there third parties available that can do the, the labeling? Yeah. Do you, is there any recommended third parties or authorized third parties that is uh, uh, allowed to do the UDI for organizations? Is the question on um, if third parties can do your good ID submissions for you? Well, I think the question was, uh, would we recommend any third parties or if we qualified any third parties to do this? No, unfortunately, we do not certify or recommend or qualify any third parties. We just don't have a program in place, I guess, to... Um, Right. Certify any third parties. There are several out there in the marketplace, um, mm -hmm. definitely, who we are working with, mm -hmm. um, but we don't really um, recommend yeah. anybody. Yeah. Unlike issuing agencies, there's no uh, analogous uh, system for certification of third parties. Right. Yeah. But by all means, we, we encourage people who think that they need a third party labeler and or just feel that it would help them in the process to reach out to people who are offering the services right now and see if you know their services work for you. We we have had very good relationships with the third party submissions that we've uh, we've encountered in the yes. past, so it's a very viable option. Yeah, we mm -hmm. get this question in the division about medical device consultants and you know, FDA does not qualify or certify consultants or mm -hmm. third parties of that type. Mm -hmm. So, good question. Did that answer your question, caller? Yes. Yes, thanks a lot. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have online, as part of the UDI label, you have one DI with a variable PI part info. Does each UDI that has a different PI part of it have to be registered in the good ID account? Do you want me to repeat that? I think we got uh, it. You got yeah, it? We okay. have it. The, the good ID uh, submissions are on a DI basis. We would expect the PI to alter as you do runs of a product, but we only require a new submission if the DI changes. Okay. It's, yeah, it's pretty, right. I think that's and about I think I mentioned in, in uh, my presentation, we do not store the PI information in the good ID. Uh, what we do store in the good ID are the flags that say which PIs should be on the label. Okay, our next question. Our technical team is interested in using two agencies, and they've identified the two, two of the ones that we've accredited. The uh, specifications are different for these two agencies. Is it possible for a single company to enter into the Good ID database information for two different agencies? Yes, you may. Um, however, I think we would ask you, so in Good ID, we have this idea or the concept of a primary device identifier, and then there is a secondary device identifier. So you may have used two different issuing agencies to um, identify a, a given device, and we would ask you to choose 
one to be the primary device identifier, and then um, the second device issuing agency you would assign as the secondary device identifier. Okay, good. And when you search uh, through Access Good ID, yes. it doesn't matter which device identifier you use to search, the record will come back. Good Absolutely. point. Okay, good question. Next question. Uh, we are a class two labeler. If we submitted an application for a new account before February 1st, what will happen? Should we resubmit assuming uh, the original application will be rejected because we were too early? Well, what, what should have already happened is that you received a response from us indicating that the Good ID database will open to Class II labelers on February the 1st of 2016 and to resubmit at that time. Now, in the past month or so, we've tried to keep cases open when people have submitted with the hope that we will be able to contact them directly and let them know that now is the time. But it doesn't hurt to respond to the response that you receive from us or to simply respond to your initial help desk submission after February the 1st and indicate that you are a Class II labeler, attach your account request, and ask for it to be processed. Now, the one caveat I would put on that is that when the good ID opens to Class II labelers, the account request is going to change slightly to indicate the changing classes that can now be submitted to the good ID for accounts. So you might want to simply start the process over again if you submitted, let's say, four months ago and we told you to come back later because that makes sure that you will have the most accurate account request PDF in front of you and that all your information will line up so that we can process the request promptly. Yeah, good question for those that were uh, proactive in getting that information in early. So let's move on to the next question. I am thinking of using uh, HL7 SPL for my good ID submissions. How long does the testing for the HL7 SPL take? Maybe Indira? Sure. Um, overall, I think the HL7 process, if you are starting up from scratch and you're looking to do it, we would say um, you should give yourself about four to eight weeks um, to do the process out of which you would first, of course, um, you know, this is does not include the time um, you would already would have spent in gathering your device data and putting it in the XML format. Um, assuming you start there and you have the XML, then you would go ahead and start working to get a um, FDA electronic submissions gateway account. You would start with the test account, you complete gateway testing, and then in parallel, you would come and you would request a good ID um, test account from us. We would give you a good ID test account, and then you use your ESG test account and submit the tests that we've specified, which is about um, five test scenarios. And then um, once you complete the testing, you submit it for our review. We review it and we approve and we'll get you a production account. And then we let the ESG folks know that they can now give you a ESG account. So the ESG process just to get the account may take anywhere from about one to three weeks. If you follow the guidelines on the website that they have and do everything um, as specified, it might be faster. Um, if there is a little bit of back and forth, like Chris mentioned in his uh, presentation, any time there is back and forth, that adds time. So the ESG, about two to three weeks. The testing with us, I would say, again, an, a, um, two, to, two to three weeks, depending on how successful you are in getting through the testing. Um, again, we ask you to do internal testing first before you do our um, test scenarios. Overall, two to, two to eight, I mean, um, about four to eight weeks in, you know, in total is what I would allocate. And again, it may go faster if you're, you know, extremely organized and you have all your ducks in a row. Um, may take the full eight weeks if you're not sure where you're starting yet. Yeah, that, that's good for planning purposes for companies that are going to use that option. Right. Indira mentioned um, making sure you have your data together. Um, we've heard from companies from previous um, compliance years that, you know, the process for getting the accounts and for getting the tests done and all of that are pretty smooth. They've said that one of the biggest um, hurdles that they had to clear was to gather all of the data that they need to submit from the information, the various information systems in their companies and have it together and ready to go. So that's something that people can be working on right now. Um, go gather your data, make sure you have everything, and then 
Again, if you can submit early, that is always better. We have, um, we are expecting, like we said, a lot of business this year, a lot of people submitting. Um, as we get into the summer months and we start being, you know, getting a lot more submissions, it, we need more time to look at them. So we have time now. Get yes. your account requests in early, mm -hmm. um, hopefully by June. And then, you know, after June, we're going to be switching over. We're going to be switching the team over to look more at the testing processes. Um, so, if, you know, we're going to still try to help people who get account requests in after June, but we just really can't guarantee that we're going to be able to respond quickly enough for you to meet your compliance date. We need to get that in very early. So don't wait to the last minute. Class 2 labelers, you know what your homework is <laughs> that you need to get done. Good question. Uh, next question, is a good idea account required if I already have a web trader account for the submission of HL7 SPL via ESG? So the web trader account via the ESG is completely separate and different from a good idea account. So this is a great question. Um, it, it gives us an opportunity to clarify. So the good idea account is what you use to submit data to the good ID. Now, ESG, you should only be needing an ESG account um, for good ID submissions if you choose to do the HL7 SPL submission option. So there are two separate accounts, so you need both. However, since the question, um, you know, the labeler is asking about the web trader account, I would say if you are thinking about using the web trader account, uh, and what the ESG web trader does is allows a user to submit one record at a time, really uploading one file at a time. So I would say if you're thinking about using WebTrader, maybe take a look at the Good ID Web Interface option because it is really submitting one record at a time by entering it manually. Earlier we talked about the resources necessary for SPL. So resources, you know, it's, it's, it's more resource intensive. So if you're thinking to submit it one file at a time, it may be worth your while just to enter it, I would say. So really, if you're doing SPL, we would encourage you to consider it if you plan to use the ESG, it's called the B2B or the business-to-business -business option, the AS2 account option. That would be the ideal way to use SPL. Now, if you're thinking of WebTrader, um, you know, just, just consider the manual data entry option. It may save you a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Linda, if you want to add anything to mm -hmm. that. I that I agree. Yeah, good question and, and good advice from our experts here on the panel, so thank you. Moving on to the next question, uh, what are the test results that must be submitted for the HL7 method of submission? Where can I find more information about submissions using this process? So what are the test methods or test results that must be submitted and then where can they find more information? So the test results, so there are five test scenarios that we've um, outlined for users, and they are really the bare minimum that we would expect somebody to do. So before a um, user even gets to the point of um, doing our test scenarios, the, um, our suggestion is that um, you know, they do thorough testing with their data, above and beyond the minimum test scenarios that we have out there. And once you do our test scenarios, they would need to submit the DI number um, for the record that they used for that test scenario, um, the data values that they submitted and what data values they changed. And we, in fact, have all of this information on what test scenarios, what to submit for review. Everything is on our website. If you go to udi.gov and navigate to the Good ID section, under the Good ID section, there is an HL7 SPL section. If you go there, um, they'll be able to get a package of files, which includes this test. It's specifically, there is a file called Good ID Test Criteria. They'll be able to grab this information. So the, the UDI website has that information. It's, yes. Uh, class 2 labelers should be familiar with that site, go to that site, mm -hmm. to make sure they're educated on the requirements. Yes. Mm -hmm. So another good question. Moving on. Uh, do we need to go to an accredited issuing agency prior to requesting a good ID account? It's not required. However, if you're going to start the process, 
it might be better for you to have your DI information already available. As I said, hopefully once you request an account from us, we can turn it around in one to two days, working with an issuing agency to start to create DIs and the whole chain of events that that will uh, necessitate between starting from creating a DI to actually getting it on a device and getting all the information together for the device is kind of a large undertaking. So I think that you, most people would probably be well served by getting the DI portion of it done, working with the issuing agency and getting to a point where they're ready to submit and then requesting an account from us. But that of course is up to them. There's no requirement when you fill out the account request that you submit a current DI, provide issuing agency information, anything like that. We just think that from a logical standpoint it's probably a little bit easier for the labelers to go that route. And I think Linda had in the um, earlier session today, um, Linda talked about the steps to the UDI program and one of the first ones was to um, contact issuing agency and get the DI, so absolutely. And the, the, the names and contact information is on the UDI website for the issuing agency. Yes, yes. Good, good. Okay, next question. Can you have more than one coordinator assigned to an account? Chris? Yes, you can. For any labeler DUNS, you need to have at least one coordinator assigned to the labeler DUNS. However, you may have more than one coordinator assigned to any particular labeler DUNS. You may also have multiple labeler DUNS and have multiple coordinators, and each coordinator takes only one labeler DUNS. This is a situation we will see, for example, if you have a very large company with labeler subsidiaries that work distinct from each other and don't have a one person or one group that's working on submission. In a lot of cases, it would make more sense for your organization to create the account, submit, let's say, your labeler dunces, and submit a coordinator who's responsible for each one of those. So there's a lot of permutations you can take, and it's really whatever works best for your, your organization's workflow. Good, good question. Uh, they're coming in. Next question, can the good ID coordinator be the organization's official correspondent? Absolutely, and typically that's the way a lot of smaller firms have structured it. They might not have a regulatory contact who their only job is to do regulatory affairs. Some companies we know are only going to have two or three employees overall. Uh, any person can have multiple roles. You can be a regulatory consultant or, or a contact. You can be a coordinator. You can be a labeler data entrant, or you can be all three or, or any permutation of those. It's, it's really up to your preference. Good. Good to know those roles. Next question. We have an account with an FDA accredited issuing agency. Do we also have to submit an account request to FDA? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the account with the FDA accredited issuing agency is with the issuing agency. The mm -hmm. account request with the FDA would be for the good ID. Right, so you're not sending everything to the issuing agency. You work with the issuing agency and then the labeler Submit the uh, information in the account. Yeah, I, think exactly. I think it's important to remember that there's two large uh, lanes of sort of a responsibility within the UDI rule. The one is the labeling a portion, which is where the issuing agency works with the labeler to come up with the DI to create the PI to create the UDI. And then there's also the separate data submission requirement. The issuing agencies don't interact with us in any way for that other than helping the labeler create their DI. So it's important to keep the issuing agency separate when you're thinking of the good ID. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. Uh, next question. If I want to use a third party to do my HL7 SPL submissions and the third party had submitted for other companies, can we skip the HL7 SPL testing? <laughs> No, unfortunately, no. We do have, as we mentioned in, an, in response to an earlier question, we do have third parties who have several labeler clients. However, um, you know, what we've learned is um, the data sets for each labeler would be different based on the device type that's being used, and there may be data elements that you may need to work with that, um, you know, may be irrelevant to certain device types. So, 
every labeler is required to complete the testing even though you may have a very experienced third party out there um, we again deal with the labeler so we will work with you and the process we have in place is really applicable to the labeler it's the labeler's purview to choose to work with the third party which is completely fine um, but you as a labeler is the one that we work with and um, the labeler is also held accountable for the information submitted to Good ID. So um, if you do use a third party, make sure that the data you give to the third party actually gets loaded correctly to Good ID. So it may be in your best interest to log in um, and make sure that you can pull up your record and in fact, um, you know, your record is correct and, and data quality is really important. So remember, um, Again, it's your data, and if we have questions on your data, then we, we work with the labeler, we come to the labeler, and um, we definitely work mm -hmm. with third parties. And we don't have the testing processes in place just to be difficult. Um, you know, it takes more time on our part, too. We're yes. not trying to just take more of your time. They're really in place to help you to make sure that your Absolutely. data is coming in correctly. Data quality is so important for this database. This is being made available to the public. Um, people are actually looking up information in that database, they're downloading it, they're using it. We really need the data quality to be good. So we encourage the labelers, as Indira was saying, please, even if you go through a third party to submit your information, you need to go in and make sure the data is right. Yeah, so uh, the first hour we, we, we said a few times, no exemptions, and that includes this testing requirement. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. Okay, good. Uh, our next question. If I already have an active ESG account, the testing account you speak of would be respect would be in respect to the good idea account only, correct? The wording of this question is a little yes, off. Yes, no, that's a good question, yeah. and I think they'd be absolutely. If you have an existing FDA ESG account, then you would need to just get a good ID test account. However, you would still need to use the FDA ESG test account to send test submissions, complete the testing process, and then you can use your ESG production account to send production submissions to Good ID. So I think they've got it. Yes, and they were the, the last part of the question was, or does a new ESG test environment have to be done? No. And you're saying no? Yes. Okay, good. Good question. Uh, next question. If I change the UDI information on my label, do I have to change the DI record in Good ID? Um, well, I, okay, mm -hmm. I can take. So yes, um, DIs. If you um, remember, I'm going to draw back on uh, Linda's presentation again. A DI identifies a given version or a model of a device and the labeler of a device. So if anything changed on the label relates to a change in a version or a model of the device, then a new device identifier would need to be issued, and then a new device identifier record would need to be entered into Good ID. So if, um, you know, um, labelers were to go on our website, we have something called the Data Elements Reference Table, which lists all the data elements for Good ID, and we have this uh, concept called a new DI trigger. So when certain data values change, they trigger the assignment of a new device identifier. So in which case, a new device identifier would need to be assigned to that device, and a new device record needs to be entered into Good ID. Good question. I'm looking at the clock. We have about eight more minutes. Let's see how many more questions we can get to. Can I practice on the web interface before submitting my records? Definitely. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you receive a web interface account and you open up a new DI record, it will initially go into the draft DI status. If you leave a record in draft DI status, it will never publish. But you're able to fill all the forms in that you need to on the page and see what, sort of, what the submission will look like before you actually submit. And you can do that any number of times. You can make you know, multiple draft DI records, if you would like, from multiple devices, and sort of get a feel for how the system works. And we have no problem with that. In fact, we encourage you to do that. Make sure that you're familiar with the process before you actually publish the records. It just makes it a lot easier for you. Good. And when the records are in draft, um, they don't go through a lot of the business rule validation checks that we have in the Good ID. So once you have your record looking the way you think you would like it to look in production, 
you flip the status from draft to unpublished with a published date, mm -hmm. and then it will go through all of the business rule validation checks. Good, good question. So testing is there for those uh, class two labelers. Yes. Next question. If you have three DIs for a device level of packaging, do we submit all three DIs for the same device in good ID? So if you have three DIs for a device for a device's levels of packaging, do we submit all three DIs for the same device in good ID? And I think that was that slide yes. in your talk earlier, uh, the first hour, Linda. Did you want to take it? No, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, yes, the answer is yes. All three device identifiers must be in good ID. However, we don't want to get three separate DIs in good ID, DI records in good ID. As um, Linda's slide explained what a base package is, the base package is the lowest packaging level. So the lowest packaging level would be assigned the primary DI, and that would sort of start the DI record and all the higher packaging levels. And if I remember the uh, presentation correctly, there was a uh, DI-2001, which was a package of 30, and then there was a package of 50. Mm -hmm. The package of 30 and the package of 50 would just be shown as package DIs within that same DI record. So there would be one device record, the base package would be the primary DI, and the higher level package DIs would be part of that same DI record. Good question. Uh, our next question, do manufacturers who are OEM, original equipment manufacturers, need an account if their name never appears on the label? If, if their name doesn't appear on the label, we wouldn't consider them a labeler. And the data submission requirements only apply to labelers of medical devices, so in that situation they would not. Okay. Next question, do you have a different DI submission in the good ID for the shipping packaging as well as the product label? So I think they're saying, do you have to have a different DI submission into the good ID for the shipping packages as well as the package label? I think if the question is if shipping containers need to have a device identifier, the answer is no. Shipping containers do not need to have a UDI assigned, and the information does not need to be entered into Good ID. It's only the um, package configurations, and I believe, if I recall correctly, a package is something that contains multiples of the same base package. Mm -hmm. So if I have a DI, um, going back to Linda's slide, the base package is 1001, and if I take 10 of the 1001 and I put it into a box and I call it 2001, then that is a package. However, if I take, you know, customer one wants, um, he wants... Um, customer one wants three, customer two wants six. Those go in a box. The boxes are shipping containers. They're not yep. packages. Yes, perfect. Okay, good question. Uh, next question. When I submit a record to the database, can the public view it immediately? Um, not immediately. We have, uh, Indira introduced the concept of the grace period. Uh, we have a grace period, and during this time, I'm gonna go back to my data quality soapbox. <laughs> Once um, a DI record is published, there's a 30-day grace period during which we um, allow the labelers to come in and fix their information. So that's your time to take a look at what's been submitted, make sure it's absolutely correct before it goes out into the public portal, and that'll happen on the day after the 30 days passes. Anything to add? No, I think that's perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get another one or two questions in. Next question, is there an FDA template to gather information required for the Good ID submission? So is there a template? Um, I would say the template might be the data elements reference table which really, you know, we provide you every single data element that is um, in the good ID. We tell you which ones are required, which ones are optional, which ones are conditionally required. We um, give you the description of what that data element is, and we even have a column called data entry notes where we kind of cue you in for things that you need to remember and to be aware of about that particular data element. So I think that would serve as a very good template and a starting point. Mm -hmm. 
There's so much helpful information out on our website. Um, and, you know, we, as we said before, we're expecting a very brisk business this year. Um, if you have not looked at the website, please make sure you do so. Um, look at the contents. Look at all the different documents we have out there. There's so much helpful information. It will really cut down on all the help desk questions. And, in fact, if you submit a help desk question and the information's on the website, we're just going to send you back there because we don't have time to be sorting through all of the information that's already on our site. Okay, good. I think we have time for just one more question. Does a labeler need an ESG account if using a third-party submitter? Um, it's up to the labeler. So there are third-party submitters who do what's called end-to-end -end solution. They provide end-to-end -end services. They, all you need to do is give them the data. They will put it in the XML format, and they will send it through the ESG on your behalf. Um, if you have one of those type of agreements with the third party, then no, you do not need a ESG account. However, there are third parties, so all they do is they take your data and they help you generate an XML file that can be then sent to FDA. And if that's the agreement you have with your third party, then you may have to go get the ESG account and do the sending yourself. So it could work either way. Good. So I think, Indira, you will have the last word. And thank you, <laughs> panel, as we wrap up today. Thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes today's CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. For any further questions you may have or ones we did not answer today, please send them to us at DICE. You can call us during our normal work hours or email us at DICE at FDA.HHS.gov. We'd like to know your thoughts on today's program and look forward to your feedback. Please complete the survey at the link that appears on the screen now. This survey is also available on our website. We hope you found today's program valuable. Today's program, including the presentations and Q&A sessions, will be available on the CDRH Learn website in about a week, so you can access them as a resource anytime you like. We look forward to hearing from you at DICE, and remember, we're always here to guide you through the CDRH regulatory process. We're just a phone call or email away. I would like to thank our expert panels, our CDRH colleagues that fielded questions behind the scene, the FDA studio team, and you, our audience, for joining us for today's program. Thanks.